Hello, sisters, and welcome to Go Solo Live. This is Jennifer Buchholz with Transform Via Travel. It's time to sit back, grab a cup of coffee, and enjoy my conversation with Sarah Graves Gabadon, otherwise known as Jet Set Sarah. She'll share some tips about shopping. She'll share her insights on the Caribbean. But if you get to the last three minutes of our recording today, you're going to hear the true reason why she believes in solo travel and why I do too. Tune in. Welcome to Go Solo Live. Don't you mean Go Solo Live? Have you ever been asked, why on earth would you travel alone? Go Solo Live not only answers that question, but celebrates life as a midlife solo traveler. This is a safe place for women to come together to reminisce about their travels, encourage others to travel, and to dig into the real lessons learned from these journeys. Now join Jennifer Buchholz with Transform Via Travel as she and her guests share stories of the solo travelers of midlife women. Joining me today is Sarah Greaves Gabadon, otherwise known as Jet Set Sarah. Welcome. Hello. And I always like to say, because I'm in Milwaukee and it's winter as we're recording this right now, and it probably will still be winter when it airs, where are you located? (laughs) Well, I'm in sunny Miami, where I'm happy to report it is 77 degrees and sunny. Yay! So that's jealousy in that pause, (laughs) and that's fine. I... That's why we travel is so that we don't have to stay in our only circumstance at home. Mm-hmm. Welcome to the show. I'm so glad to have you here. Jet Thank Set you. Sarah, can you start by telling me a little bit about how this, this whole Jet Set Sarah started for you? Ah, well, I think it started actually when I was four years old. I, that was the first time I ever went in a plane. Uh, We were traveling. I was born in England and I was traveling with my parents from England to Jamaica for the first time. And I remember this as clearly as if it was yesterday. Uh, We got on the plane and I looked out the window, you know, the plane took off and I looked out the window and I saw that the clouds were beneath us, which was the first time I'd ever seen that as a child. And I said to my mother, mommy, mommy, the clouds are upside down. And I remember it was just, it just blew my four-year-old mind. And I think ever since then, I've always been fascinated with travel and not just planes, but airports and just watching, you know, I still, to this day, travel has become such a schlep, but to this day, I still love to just be in the airport and see the theater of the concourse. People go by, you don't know where they're coming from, where they're going to, what the circumstances of their travel are. They're in fur coats, they're in, the next person is in cut off jeans, you know, it's just I just find the whole thing fascinating and exciting still. So I guess it was inevitable that somehow years later I would make it my career, which is as a travel writer. Okay. Four years old. I love that story. (laughs) I love that perspective. And I think we can all relate to the clouds being underneath us. They're upside down, which is so fun. How did your work progress to get you to where you are now? Well, in a nutshell, um, as a child, uh, I li- so I lived between, I was born in England and I lived between England and Jamaica my whole life, going to school in both places. And when we lived in Kingston in Jamaica, there was a fancy schmancy hotel called the Pegasus Hotel. And that's where the British Airways crew would stay. And on a Saturday, it, they, would, they had a small theater and they would do uh, like a double, a double feature film for children. So my parents always used to drop me off on a Saturday morning. I would see the double feature and then they would pick me up at lunchtime. And whenever I would go there, I would would see those British Airways flight attendants strutting through the lobby in their high heels and red coats. And they just, you know, they just like smelled of overseas. They just, they just to me represented, you know, the whole world. They were so cosmopolitan and dashing. And so I think that started my love of travel and, and airlines and hotels. And when I went away to England to do a degree in hotel management, I actually did my internship at that very same hotel 10 years later. Um, I interned there during the summer. Um, and then I went backwards and forwards my whole life working in hotels and in PR. And then from PR went on to the travel journalism side. So I have been um, a magazine editor writing specifically about the Caribbean for quite some time. And I've been a freelancer since, uh, I don't know, four or five years ago. And I have a website called jetsetsarah.com. And that's where my two passions, travel, specifically the Caribbean, and shopping, because who doesn't love to shop? Those, that's where my passions meet at jetsetsarah.com. Okay, now don't hate me, 
but I don't love to shop what? and I, I can't, I can't do it. I, <gasps> I can't, but I appreciate those who can and do. And it's actually one of the things that when I talk to people about travel, I have to make sure that I understand what their shopper profile is. Yes. And so I, that's one of, one of the other reasons why I wanted you at a, as a guest on the show, because if you left it to me, none of these conversations would involve shopping. <laughs> and I know that there's a lot of people who value it as evidenced by the fact Absolutely. that that's such a big part of what you do. So I there, appreciate that. There has actually been a survey that says that the most popular activity for anyone who travels is shopping. And, and think about it. Even someone like you who doesn't like shopping, I bet you when you go away, you at least bring back one thing from your trip. You buy something. Something. Food, underwear, I don't know, something. Hopefully not underwear. Hopefully we've handled that. <laughs> but I will say, so my criteria for shopping is I'm not a souvenir person. My criteria for shopping is I have to be able to use it in my home. Well, and that's fabulous. So that could be anything from art to a kitchen utensil. Agreed. And, 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 but, but I don't like it. And so I want you to broaden the horizons because like I said, I... This isn't something that I would naturally tend towards. Can you just take it down like the range of shopping, whether we're talking about the, for me, sometimes it's fun at a flea market, all the way up to the more exclusive shopping or things that are local specific, which I think right. there are, there's a huge appeal towards the local right. specific stuff when people are shopping. Absolutely. So for a lot of people, when they think about the Caribbean, which is my wheelhouse, they think about duty-free shopping. And there's yes. absolutely nothing wrong with that. Destinations like St. Thomas, which is the Caribbean's most popular cruise destination, is known for shopping. And you get all the big designer, brand, designer brands from Europe, et cetera, at very good prices. Nothing wrong with that. But my jam is I want people to shop local. I want people to buy something that when they look at it, when they get it home and they look at it, it gives them a, a real warm, fuzzy feeling about where they were. They have a story to tell. Hopefully they might've had a chance to meet the artisan who made it. That, that makes a story even bigger and richer. It really, honestly, it, it, retailing it can, really can be a window into a culture that is accessible for most people. And so you know, I am personally offended if people go to the Caribbean and they come back, particularly if they go to Jamaica, and they come back with one of those woolen hats with the fake dreadlocks attached. Please, please, I'm begging you for make the love of God. Don't make it stop. Please don't do that. Don't. There are so many other things that you can buy besides one of those or a shot glass or a fridge <laughs> magnet that was made somewhere else. You know, get a piece of art, get a wood carving, get some Blue Mountain coffee for your coworkers. Um, you know, if get some rum, of course, in the Caribbean, you've got to have rum. If you're an Antigua, maybe you will get some black pineapple jam because they have amazing black, uh, a variety of pineapple called black pineapple. They're sweet and fantastic tasting. Uh, you know, buy something local. So when you give it to someone and they say, oh, you shouldn't have, they don't really mean it, but <laughs> they really are like thankful. They're not thinking, oh my goodness, why did you give me this tchotchke that I now have to throw away or re -give? And if you have it for yourself, every time you look at it, you know, either it's got to be useful, it's got to be beautiful, it's got to bring back a good memory for you. I think it's really important. Well, and I will say that, again, I'm traveling mostly with women. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting how many women want to buy some clothing mm -hmm. when they're traveling. So do you, what are your recommendations, you know, for that? I, you know what? That's a good, I'm glad you bring that up because context is key. Have you ever, well, you don't shop, but I'm sure maybe some of your listeners can relate. You go somewhere and everyone is wearing, you know, X. Everyone is wearing harem pants, which actually I love, but um, my husband called them poopy pants, but that's another story. <laughs> You, you know, the drape. You know? Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> so you may go to Southeast Asia or somewhere and everyone is wearing hair and pants and you say, I must have a pair. Just take, just take a pause for a second and think, am I ever going to wear these at home in my real life? Fair enough. You know, I mean, if you're going to wear them to yoga class, great. If you can rock them to work, great. But make sure you're going to wear them because I don't think you should just shop for shop's sake shopping sake, you know? So think about context. Think about, imagine, can you imagine yourself wearing this article of clothing anywhere but right here, right now? And if you can't, don't buy it. That's not the thing for you. Pick an accessory instead. 
you know, get a piece of jewelry by a local designer. I have, um, I'm not fan of the, I'm not a fan of the Pandora type newfangled charm bracelet, but I have a very old one, the old school one. And, and for a long time, everywhere I went, I bought a silver charm. It was a small piece. It was affordable. It was incredibly portable because it's, you know, as big as my thumbnail. But then I have this amazing sort of, I said, I'm going to be one of those old ladies with a big jingling, jangling <laughs> charm bracelet that has, you know, probably 60 charms on it now. And that was just my thing. So sometimes it's good to shop in themes. So maybe you're, and that stops you from buying things you'll never use. So maybe you say, okay, I, everywhere I go, I'm going to buy myself a silver or a gold charm for my bracelet, or I'm going to buy, I don't know, maybe it's a fridge magnet, but you know what I mean? I if you, sometimes if you shop in a theme, that's easier because at least you know, you'll use it. I think that makes a lot of sense. And again, for me to say, I'm not a shopper, that does not mean that I don't purchase. Um, one of the one of the things that I have done recently is I've been to Columbia a couple of times and mm -hmm. so they're known for emeralds. So oh. I did purchase some emerald earrings. And so to find something that is something that a region is known for. Yes. And that is unique. Absolutely. Right. I, I went to Bora Bora um, twice last year. I know, I know, but um, I went there twice and both times we actually went on a pearl farm. And so I'm not really a pearls person, but of course I bought pearls. We, but, it's, but when I look at those things, it's a reminder of a larger experience where I learned about the different types of pearls. I learned that I wasn't the person who wanted the perfectly symmetrical white pearls. I love the Baroque pearls, which are asymmetrical and different colors and, you know, from yellow to black and blah, 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 blah. But now, so I have a pair of pearl earrings now, but they are specific to that trip. They're specific to me. They bring back specific memories. Um, and they're so emblematic of the region that I went to. Absolutely. That's perfect. And so again, there are, there are things, but like, it's not thing that for me, it's not my nature to even think about what something might be known for when it comes to shopping. How do you, aside from going to your website, which is a beautiful resource, but let's say they weren't traveling in the Caribbean. How do people find out maybe what's the best thing to be shopping for or keeping your eye out for when they're traveling as well as maybe some things to possibly avoid. Mm. Okay. So, you know, she's, people experience the world through different lenses, different windows, right? So for example, my husband loves to eat. So when we are going anywhere new, he's immediately online and Googling, you know, what, what are the best restaurants in this place? Or what do you have to eat when you go here? So I'm, I'm not so much about the eating, but I am about the shopping. So I do basic research just like anyone else would do. I might Google, you know, best Jamaican souvenirs or something like that. And then, and then that gives me a broad overview and then I can zero in on stuff. I use actually my favorite search engine, to be honest, is Instagram. I get, I'm a very visual person. So I get a lot of ins, insp uh, inspiration from that people on so Instagram, sense. right? And I don't follow Instagram really well. So you, but what you're talking about, that is brilliant. And yeah, a lot of people so, are doing that. Yeah, so, so I'm, I, I'm also into, search? So I'm also into fashion and style. So for example, I might... Go, I, I might start by Googling Jamaican souvenirs and then I find out, I see someone and they're wearing this beautiful pair of handmade leather sandals and somehow I find that they're made by this woman called Bridget and she was an ex-Playboy bunny and now she's been making leather sandals for the last 20 years. She has an atelier in Kingston and they're available online and they're available at this hotel and before you know it, I've, I'm down the rabbit hole and before I've even left left town, I know, okay, when I go to Jamaica, I'm getting a pair of Bridget sandals because they're fantastic. You know what I mean? Absolutely. It's, it's easy to get lost in the world of shopping and stuff like that. Absolutely. I love it. I'm, I'm overwhelmed thinking about that. Let's talk for a moment about the various shopping experiences and some people feel safe bargaining Mm. Okay. Handling. Shopping tips. Should we talk about some shopping tips? Let's okay. do it. And these are, these ones that I'm telling you are specific from my Caribbean experience, but I actually think that they, they could go across the board. Okay. So there's, there's an art to this. So first of all, I would say my, some of my tips would be, let's say you're in a craft market and sometimes depending on where you are, the craft market can be a little bit intimidating because of course every vendor wants you to come over to them, blah, blah, blah. So I think of it, it is like a retail buffet. <laughs> and when you go to the buffet, smart people 
do a lap of the buffet first, right? Before putting anything on their plate. That's the awesome. Same way, right? And so in the same way in a craft market, when you go, I encourage you to do a lap first. Keep a comfortable distance between you and all the stalls and just look around and see what there is. Because otherwise, you end up buying the first three things you see at the first person. And then, you know, when you're leaving, going back to the ship or your hotel or whatever, you see a thousand more things that you think, oh, I could have spent my money on that, right? Instead of filling up my plate with stuff I'm, eh, eh, right? So I would say, do a lap, observe, take, you know, take, take some breaths, see what there is, right? And then, I would say to you, talk to the person, um, but bear in mind, to, to, when you're speaking to the vendor, bear in mind that once you touch something, you have expressed an interest. So don't be one of those people who goes up and touches 20 things on the vendor's table, but you're not going to buy anything. Don't touch it unless you want it. That's my rule. That's a very right? good, very good rule. Don't, don't t t t pick it up until you want it. Because as a vendor, also, I, I'm a smart vendor. I'm thinking, right, once you've touched that, that's 50% of, of the sale right there. Because I know if you've had enough of an interest to touch it and pick it up and hold it and turn it over and look around, you really like it. So make sure you like it before you pick it up. Um, and then, you know, bargain. Don't be afraid to bargain. And I would say my, what I always do is I have one pocket that has larger bills in it and one pocket that has a few smaller bills in it. Love this. Right? I love these tips, right? ladies. So, so if you, you know, suppose something is being offered for 15, but you think 10 is more reasonable, you know, maybe you, you start by, now you don't, you never want to offend the person because they're a craftsperson person. They're trying to make a living just like you are. So you're not going to immediately offer somebody, you know, 30% of what they tell you it costs, but you know, start a little less than you think you want to pay. So maybe you start talking at seven the person starting at 15 and you meet in the middle at 10 and then you don't, you know, don't come out with your big $50 bill bill at the end of it and say, can I have change? That's, that's awful. It's bad you know, taste, people. Right, exactly. It's bad taste. So then that's when you go into your pocket with the small bills and you count out your fives and your ones and, you know, you give it to the vendor. So mm. that's definitely a tip. And also, I think you have to be prepared to walk away, honestly. And sometimes, sometimes, you can, if you're with someone, you can have them say, look, we got to go. There's a time constraint. You've got to say, look, 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 you're bargaining and the person, maybe the vendors are coming down to where you want to be. And your friend is saying, look, look, we've got to go. And you look as if, well, I'm sorry, we can't come to an arrangement. You know, sometimes when there's a little incentive of a time crunch, you get what you want for the price you want it. So it's a game. And I think in most places, certainly in the Caribbean, as long as you're doing it with respect and politeness, people haggling is, is that's expected. We're not expecting you if I tell you it's $20, I'm not necessarily expecting you to give me $20 right there. I'm hoping that you'll, you know, you'll give me 15. Do when people do pay the regular full price, mm -hmm. are they looked upon by others then around them as easy bait? Well, you know, I'm not saying you should never pay full price because sometimes you see things, something you love, it speaks to you. Maybe you don't have a lot of time or maybe you just simply respect the work that has gone into making whatever it is you want. And you know what? Pay full price. Mm -hmm. you've, you've, you've likely wasted more money on a cup of coffee and a donut every day for the last two weeks. You know what I mean? So, so I, I'm not saying never stay full, full price. I'm just saying don't pay full price if you don't have to or if you don't want to. Let's also talk for a moment about like the exchange rate or the currency in which deals are being made. And I've, I've seen that there's often that the U S dollar is often commonly accepted. Yes. Are you, are you finding that it might be better to bargain in one currency than another? You know, is it worth them exchanging their I think, money? I, you know what? I think if you can bargain in your home currency, if your, for example, if your home currency is U.S., that's always better for you because you understand the value of that, right? If I tell you that something costs three thousand Jamaican dollars, you're freaking out until you know that the exchange rate is more than a hundred to one, and so three thousand Jamaican dollars is not very much in U.S. at all. Got so it. I, th I think it's yeah, and in most destinations in the Caribbean, certainly in the English-speaking Caribbean, people will readily accept U.S. dollars, and um, of course, if you're in the French islands like Guadeloupe or Martinique or French Saint Martin, uh, they're more ready. They will also accept euros so you know it's up to you but if you can bargain in your 
in your own local currency, it gives you an advantage simply because that's the currency you're familiar with. That makes a lot of sense. That's, that makes sense. Okay. Any other shopping tips? Hmm. There's nothing worse than what I call retail regret. There's nothing worse than sitting in seat 17C on the way home and kicking yourself and thinking, oh my God, I should have bought that X that I saw in the market in St. Thomas or in the boutique in Montego Bay. So I just say to yourself, sometimes, sometimes maybe something costs a little bit more than you want to spend, or sometimes you're not a hundred percent sure where that piece of art is going to go, but you know what? You may pass this way only once. I, that's, that's my, whenever I'm somewhere, I just think I may never be back here again. Do I want to sit on the plane and wish that I had bought this for the rest of my life? Or do I really want to have it? Because you know what? Here's the thing. If you buy it and you get it home and it's not right, that's what eBay is for, my friend. Uh-huh. Uh, that's, that's why re-gifting opportunities come around. You can always get rid of it, but if you didn't buy it, you can't magically have it the next day. So that's a good point. I would say if you love it, if it speaks to you, buy it and worry about it later. Okay. Well, that's a very good point too. How much do people usually, and I, I think this is a unusual question maybe, but you know, since shopping is so popular when traveling, how much do you suggest setting aside from a budget standpoint? Oh, okay. So I would never dream to tell people how much to spend or how to spend their money because that's a very personal choice, right? You know, for me, I would rather skip a couple of meals and buy a new handbag. Um, Someone else may feel like I don't need anything at all, but I would rather have a gourmet meal at a very expensive restaurant when I'm traveling. So I don't know. I think it's completely up to you. I don't, I don't think that the rules of shopping in that respect are any different when you're traveling that are, are, than they are when you're at home. That it's up sense. to you. It's up yep. to your resources and, and your preferences. What about the general acceptance of credit cards? I think and, that's a good thing. And you're, you're suggest, do you suggest that people if they are planning to shop, is using a credit card advisable? Oh, I, wise, yeah, like certainly. That? Yeah, certainly. If I were, I love to buy art. Um, and certainly if I'm going into a gallery or, or a, you know, a proper merchant, a brick and mortar merchant, absolutely. I'm going to buy that piece of art with a credit card, not only because it's safer, but because of the protection it gives me for the, the article, particularly if it's something you're having shipped to you, suppose it never arrives, you know, because you leave the store in good faith that that, you know, urn that you bought is going to arrive at home, but suppose it never does. Right. If you pay in cash, you're going to have a much harder time getting your money back than if you dispute it with a credit card company. So absolutely. I think when you can shop with your credit card and if you're going to do that, make sure it's a credit card that doesn't cha- charge you uh, foreign transaction fees. Got it. Because obviously those can add up, particularly if you're, if you're a, uh, um, rabid shopper like me. <laughs> Those can add up. Absolutely. No, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. That's important. The foreign transaction fees is very important to mm-hmm. keep in mind. Um, goodness. Now, I know you probably don't like to play favorites. <laughs> I can guess what you're going to ask me. <laughs> so rather than ask you to play favorites, because I know that you write about some of your favorites on your blog, let's say that someone is looking for a more authentic getaway and we'll cover resorts separately, but let's say that they're looking for a couple different experiences that would be considered this more authentic experience from a, especially solo from a place of safety and to have a really authentic, amazing experience. Mm -hmm. Do you have a couple suggestions for that? I do. Um, There are for, not just for women, but for anyone, there are certainly Caribbean destinations that are easier for the solo travel to negotiate than others. Got it. To navigate, sorry, than others. One of my, it's my person, one of my personal favorites, but I love Anguilla. Anguilla um, is just about a 30 minute ferry ride from St. Martin. So you would fly into into St. Martin, you take a little uh, there's usually whichever resort you're going to has a taxi service that will take you from the airport five minutes drive to the ferry. And then you get on a 30 minute ferry and you arrive in Anguilla. Anguilla is only 30 something square miles, but it's got 33 pristine beaches. And I don't mean, you know, some are great and some are, uh, no, I mean, they're all fantastic. And not only are they all fantastic, but you can pretty much have a third of them to yourself on any given day of the week. 
That so, sounds amazing. It's, it's, it's a fabulous destination. And, and here's the thing. I like to compare it to St. Bart's. If, if it's very near St. Bart's. Um, if, if St. Bart's and Anguilla were sisters, they're both incredibly wealthy sisters. But one sister is fancy and highfalutin and a bit snobby. That could be the French one. And then the other one, which could be Anguilla, is the boho chic, <laughs> relaxed, barefoot casual, I have money, but I don't really think about it kind of sister, right? I love so, that comparison. Right? So, I mean, they're both great, but Anguilla is a sort of um, stealth wealth destination. You know, some of the wealthiest people in the world live there and travel there. And the person sitting next to you at the beach bar in shorts and barefoot could be a billionaire, but you would never know. It's a very re relaxed, barefoot, casual destination that at the same time has a very high standard of hotels. There's a Four Seasons there, Cap Jaluca Belmond Resort. Um, there are uh, six very high-end resorts there and then beautiful, luxurious villas. And then, you know, places like the first hotel, Lloyd's, where you can get in there for $100 a night. And, and, and to be honest, in the end, the Anguilla experience isn't about being locked up in a resort. It's about getting out and being with the people. And the people are so... So genuinely friendly, genuinely interested in sharing their island with you. If you show an interest and a respect for them, you, that's exactly what you get back. Uh, the food is fantastic. There's a thing called Anguillian crayfish, which is like, imagine, imagine like a, it's sort of like a, a, the most succulent, juicy shrimp on steroids, like a lobster sized shrimp. And they're specific to Anguilla. And honestly, you haven't lived until you've had one. There are three offshore islands um, from Anguilla, Silly Key, Prickly Pear, and uh, Sandy Island. And all of them are great places to go and have your Anguillian crayfish and some fantastic rum punch. What can I tell you? And, oh, and so, and from also, not to get off track, but from the viewpoint of a solo traveler, it's a small island, 30 something square miles. So you're never going to get lost. It's basically one, one road that goes around the whole island. You will be very comfortable renting a car. Um, you are very comfortable stopping and asking anyone for directions. It's a very safe island, very welcoming and warm. Uh, to me, it's a perfect place to go if you're a solo traveler. That says a lot as well. And it's something that I want people to really keep in mind that, again, when we're talking about this stuff, we are coming from that perspective of the solo traveler and to be aware of some of those nuances. Absolutely. That when you just think destination, you might not look at the whole picture and, and that gives you a little bit more information about it. Okay. So now, I, again, beautiful comparison. So where do you go for those... like? I like an all-inclusive resort vacation mm -hmm. once in a while. Yes. Uh, you know, it's nothing wrong be, with that. Not to be I, spoiled and pampered. Yeah. What are a couple of your recommendations on those? Okay. Well, first of all, so let me say, I, I, you know, all-inclusives have gotten kind of a bad rap because people say, oh, you know, you never get out of the resort and, and it's all buffet lines and it's all, you know, kind of substandard. That's not the case. If, if that's how you feel about all-inclusives, you really need to think again and have a quick Google search because all-inclusives have come a long way, baby. They were started in 1950s in the world by the founder of Club Med, but the first all-inclusive in the Caribbean was in 1978 in Jamaica. It still exists. It's called Couples Tower Isle. I was actually there a couple of weeks ago. But the point is that all-inclusives have evolved past the stereotypes that you, you may have of them. So they don't, you don't always have to wear a wristband. Um, they're not all buffets. Sandals Resorts, for example, you know, each of them has at least 10 restaurants that you can choose from in the evening. And, you know, maybe one buffet and the rest are all a la carte. There's fine dining, reservations, only restaurants. Um, you're not having some sort of bare Spartan room. You're now plunge, um, suites, plush suites with their own plunge pools that come with butler service. Uh, you, you know, seriously, all inclusives. This is not your grandparents all inclusive. So I, I think there's a lot to be said for the freedom of going on vacation, paying for your vacation up front and never having to worry about money again while you're on holiday. Right. Agreed. Because there's nothing worse than sitting there and thinking, right. Can my, can I afford to have dinner tonight? Or, you know, am I going to be able to eat three meals today? Or, you know what I mean? So all inclusives are great for convenience and they've come a long way. And I have many, many favorites. Um, I think, you know, I love Club Med. I went to 
there's a Club Med adults only section called the Zen the Zen, oh my goodness, uh, mm, look up Club Med Punta Cana. Okay. <laughs> and there is a section called the Zen, I want to say the Zen Garden, but it's not called the Zen Garden. The Zen something or the other. Okay. And that is their all inclusive, their adults only section. And it is so elegant and affordable. There are children and families in the other part of the resort, but you would never know. You could, it's sort of a resort within a resort concept. So you can stay and hang with other adults who are in couples or singles. Or you can go and, you know, be amongst the general population of the resort. But I think that that convenience of knowing I can have as many cocktails as I like, I can have, you know, a, a, one of the things that amazed me, of course, because Club Med is a French company, was the standard of the food. And every day at lunchtime, there would be a chef on the buffet line searing lobes of foie gras. Now, you might not be into duck liver, but I can just say that I don't think anyone expects at an all-inclusive you're going to have pan-seared foie gras offered on the buffet line at lunchtime. Mm, yeah. But absolutely. Sure. Uh, Club Med Putacan I love, and I love the Club Med in the Bahamas. It, it's on a small out island called San Salvador. And uh, that too is fantastic with the most beautiful be a beach that looks like it's been color corrected and photo filtered, but it has not. It's just the most fantastic beach ever. So Club Med um, in San Salvador in the Bahamas also. It's called Club Med Columbus Isle. It's fantastic. That sounds amazing. So we're almost getting to the point where we're out of time, but we're not quite there yet. Okay. And when you and I started our conversation today, we got into this, are you really a solo traveler? Mm. And I would like to make sure that we understand what solo travel means and that it could be a wide range. There's not one definition. So let's go back to that conversation. Talk about what your travels are and right. then talk about how they they do, they are considered solo travel. Yes. So I am, um, in case I didn't make it clear, so I'm a travel journalist and I specialize in the Caribbean. I like to call myself a caravangelist because I'm spreading the gospel of the Caribbean. I want people to understand that all countries, Caribbean countries are different. The language is different. The food, the topography, the geography, you know, the Caribbean is so diverse. It's not just one island split into little 30 something different islands or distinct cultures. So as part of that, my, that's my mission. And how I accomplish this mission is I write about the Caribbean for brands like Travel and Leisure and Brides and um, the Telegraph newspaper in England and my own website, jetsetsera.com. So I spend three out of four weeks of the year usually in the Caribbean. So that's why it's good that I'm in Miami, the gateway to the Caribbean. Um, and I may be traveling one of three ways. I may be traveling on myself on an individual trip as a guest of a hotel or a destination. So I'm on my own. That's it. I'm, that's the most specific definition of solo travel. Of course, I'm meeting other people all the time. I'm interviewing managers and restaurant owners and blah, 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 but I'm on my own. I also, um, I used to work as an editor on a staff in a magazine. And at that time I used to travel with a photographer. So then the two of us essentially were solo travelers together, navigating a destination by ourselves, renting a car, you know, getting around, fulfilling the needs of the publication that we were at at the time. But also much more frequently now, now that I'm a freelancer is that I travel with other journalists, but I don't necessarily know any of those journalists before meeting them at the airport or at the resort. So I might be in a group of seven people, say six other journalists from uh, five or six other journalists from another publication, plus a publicist maybe. And we are traveling together, but we all have different storylines, different angles that we're pursuing on the story. And, you know, we're all, we all have different missions. So I'm, I'm traveling with strangers or I'm traveling on my own, basically, but never alone, I guess. It makes complete sense. And the conclusion that we came to, you know, it, when you're traveling with your spouse, that's not solo travel. Right. But we've also, I've also talked to some people about what we've termed tag along travel. Mm. That when the spouse, and it's, it, since I'm talking to women, we're going to generally say the spouse is the man. Right. Um, when they're going somewhere for a conference, or meetings, whether it's a domestic or international destination, and the spouse, the wife takes along, they're still traveling solo for a good chunk of that trip. Exactly. Because the spouse is there for work. So 
that idea of tag along travel, I think does have a lot of solo travel components. And in fact, for me was how I started solo traveling because my ex was going to New York city and to new Orleans. And I'm like, Oh, you're not leaving me behind. <laughs> and those were my first times to both of those cities. Right. And he was not only involved in work all day, but then into the evening, because that was the nature of the work that they were doing. And there was the he was networking after the work and things like that. So I had a ton of solo time in which I explored those cities, which is one of my favorite things to do. And next thing I know, I'm like, Hey, I really like traveling alone. Like it was nice to have him there at points, but it also wasn't, it wasn't critical to my enjoyment of the trip. So tag along travel, I think is also a way to get your feet wet. Absolutely. And I just, I just wanted to say, as we're talking about solo travel, um, you know, people sometimes wonder, what, why would you do it? You know, what's the point? And for me, the biggest thing is that when you, and you don't realize this when you're at home, but when you're at home, your vision of who you are is formed by your environment and the people that are around you. You know, your parents, your friends, your spouse, your whoever, you know, you are Sarah and this is what Sarah does and this is who Sarah is. But you know, when Sarah is on the plane or, uh, or when Sarah is in the airport or when Sarah is, you know, 3000 miles away in Bora Bora, say, I am whoever I say I am. You know, it's an opportunity for reinvention every single time you leave your house. And why would you not want that? You know, you can just try on a new personality. You, you don't have to worry. You'll probably never see these people again. So you can do anything you want. That's so liberating. There's so much freedom in that. So when people say to me, I'm afraid to travel alone, I think, I think you should be afraid to stay at home because you're going to be locked into that one vision of yourself that other people have given you. But if you get, you step on a plane, you touch down somewhere and all of a sudden you can be who you want to be. There are no constraints. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. I want to take that testimonial that you just gave about solo travel and consider that one of my core reasons for doing this work. Absolutely. Because when people are trying to work through junk or go through a change and they're on the cusp of that, that's where solo travel can be so, so transformational because none of the people around you have any history, impression, or vested interest. Exactly. Precisely what I'm saying. And that's so liberating. That is like, oh, that's the angel scene when that happens. It's just amazing. You can do, you know, am I the sort of person who would zip line at home? Never in a million years. But you know, here I am in the Yucatan and there's that zip line and I feel pretty confident that you know, the people here know what they're doing. Heck, I'm going to try it. And then I, I realize I am a zip planning type of person, you know? I agree. And that's what's so funny. And I will say that that's been the biggest challenge to come home and have people be like, so you did what? Mm -hmm. And yet it, there, it's almost like you're giving yourself permission to experiment. Yes, absolutely. And the stakes are relatively low. I mean, I'm not suggesting that you be unsafe in any way or do something. Agreed. That you know, I do believe that, you know, you have to become, as travelers in life, you need to become uncomfortable with discomfort. Sorry, become comfortable with being uncomfortable because um, as I am learning and relearning every day, that it's in the discomfort that the magic and the growth happens. It's in those moments where you are out of your element that the magic really happens and that the opportunity for growth presents itself. And so travel in the, you know, is absolutely transformative and solo travel even more so transformative in that way. I don't think we could say it any better. Sarah, can you please <laughs> let everybody know where they can find you? Yes, please come and visit me at jetsetsarah.com, my website. You can find me on Instagram at jetsetsarah, on Facebook at facebook.com slash jetsetsarah, and on Twitter at, you guessed it, jetsetsarah, and that's with an H on the end all one word. Awesome. Sarah, I really appreciate you taking your, the time to share with us, not just the shopping tips, not just the Caribbean trip tips, but philosophically why this is such an important thing for women and people in general to do. I really it, appreciate it. It has been my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Wasn't it great to hear the stories that Sarah shared with us today? She had some great tips, but to me, more importantly, it's so amazing that she echoed my philosophy of transformation through travel. Think about it. Think about who you want to be when you travel solo. You get to create that. 
If you love these stories and want to help support Go Solo Live, you can do that by making a small financial contribution to the show at www.patreon.com slash go solo live. Stop by and show the love. Again, that's www.patreon.com. We've reached the end of another episode, but the conversation doesn't have to end there. Find us on Twitter at Go Solo Live. And if you're interested in being a guest on the show, reach out to me at Jennifer at TransformViaTravel.com. And until next time, remember, go solo, not alone.